Now, let's move to business, because this is what it's all about. It's value creation, it's value distribution, and it's jobs. In the next session, we will talk to companies that see great commercial potential in this sector. We will look into the capital side and which risks and opportunity that lies in front of investors and developers. But first, we will go to Haag. We'll go and listen to Shell, the, global, the huge global integrated energy company. Offshore wind is a growth area for Shell. And they recently actually decided to build the world's largest offshore wind project, which is, is producing uh, green hydrogen. We can't wait to uh, have with us uh, Hugo Buiz. He's the general manager for commercial uh, offshore wind in Shell. And he's with us from Haag, I hope. It should be. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Hugo. So I'm just <laughs> there. I can see you as well. Uh, welcome. So we are here to, as you said, uh, you have a great uh, ambitions to deliver on the offshore wind sector. So I just leave it to you to have a presentation and I'll get back to ans uh, ask you some questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I'm really happy to be here in, uh, in Stavanger, although I'm at home, as you can see. Um, and I also, what I find important is, is safety in, uh, in offshore wind. Um, what I've seen that I think below me, there is the sign of where to go to in case of incidents. So I assume that you've got all the, let's say, knowledge to get out in case of uh, something is happening um, in your, um, at the conference. Um, Hugo Baas, responsible for uh, the offshore wind uh, tender phase, the commercial phase. Um, so really uh, good to be here. Um, I will share my presentation. This is the disclaimer, um, which means basically that everything I say should not be used for trading. Uh, and that's about it. Um, but then the most important one is how we look at the, um, uh, the goals for 2050. Uh, quite recently, we have been um, sharpened those goals to become net zero in 2050 as a company. Um, and um, yeah, before or uh, yeah, at least before 2050. Yes. Yep, I will. I think it is working now, right? Do you also have the full screen? Yes, you have. Okay, so our goal is uh, latest 2050 or earlier to become a net zero emission energy uh, business and, uh, and therefore uh, contributing to the, um, uh, the ambition of 1.5 degrees uh, in, 20, uh, in 2050. Um, we do that because uh, we really believe it is necessary. And we also do that together with our partners. Uh, the way we look at the energy transition is that customers should be uh, together with us in front in order to go through the transition and therefore have a balance between um, the generation side, but also the demand side. Um, if you look at how it actually works today, uh, offshore wind started with the subsidy scheme on the generation side. Uh, and that was also something which will happen that way in Norway. As soon as you get to the point where it is, let's say, market equal, um, you must make the shift towards a more demand steered transition. So the way we look at it, uh, Shell, how to, uh, to do business is basically in three positions. That is the customer that is trading and is generation. And those three should form an integrated value chain and business cases where you can build um, offshore wind on. Where we are today is in, um, in, in Europe, 
Uh, we have a wind farm in the Netherlands already since uh, 2006. Um, and we are building uh, the next one, uh, which is uh, Borsele 3.4 on the bottom side. It's called Blauwind. Um, we have leases in the US. Um, we have onshore wind. And uh, we also have a pilot uh, on, on Tetra Spar in Norway. So that's really nearby. And we think that both bottom fixed but also floating will be parallel to each other and especially in Norway. Recently, we have won the uh, HKN uh, tender in the Netherlands, which is a subsidy free one. Um, and part of that tender um, was to show the innovation part in the wind farm. And I will go deeper into that later on. As Shell, we bring experience. A lot of oil and gas experience, we think, is applicable to the offshore wind business. And we have a long history in Norway and looking also forward to work with you together in Norway on offshore wind. We will bring this expertise, but we will work together. Um, we had just a, a, a part on the, on the fisheries, uh, and we believe that working together um, in close cooperation with everyone involved at sea and also lending the power onshore is important to, um, to get good and sustainable projects in place. So our basic belief is that we will work together as we also do in our oil and gas business today. Already mentioned is that uh, besides, let's say, our business, we believe that a strong business to being built should be on a long-term vision, supporting the industry local in Norway. Um, I think that Norway has a very good long-term view on how to develop industries like that. Um, and with this long-term view, we can build as a company uh, good business cases and support the jobs in your country. Today we are um, demonstrating uh, the Tetra Spar in Norway. It's, uh, it's a strong partnership together with uh, Stisdal and, uh, and Energy. Uh, and we see that the floating tenders are coming up in Norway, but also in other countries. Uh, in Europe, uh, but also in Asia. So the combination of both bottom fixed and, um, and floating will be uh, side by side, we believe. Recently, we have won the uh, HKN bid in the Netherlands. Um, and what you see happening in the Netherlands is that it, it went from a subsidy business to a subsidy free business, to a tender process in which we had to demonstrate uh, our strategy and our vision for um, 2050, how the system could look like. Bringing all that offshore wind power to shore will be a challenge. And um, the Dutch system, system can absorb this around up to 2030, but if we want to increase the uh, offshore wind projects, the amount, we need to have a solution for that. So if you look at offshore wind, it's of course intermittent. And that intermittency requires a flexible green demand in the system. Um, in this wind farm, we will demonstrate the conversion to hydrogen and also back to power. And we will do that on a megawatt scale which has not been done before. And that plan was part of the winning bid uh, in the Netherlands. The next tender, uh, the Dutch government will look at um, how to integrate it more and more into the system. So not only by hydrogen production offshore, but also by uh, flexible demand onshore. So 
this cooperation over the three areas of customer trading and generation, we believe is a success factor of an energy transition, making it as cheap and fast as possible, but at the same time, creating good business cases for us and others. The uh, wind, par wind farm in the Netherlands will be in operation in 2023, which is really soon and therefore also contributing to the targets of the Netherlands. So this was a quick presentation. Um, what I want to do is go now in interaction with you. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to, uh, to ask myself and I will, uh, I will answer them. Thank you, Hugo. Uh, give him an applause. Uh, uh, as we've said earlier today, your questions can be given at slido.com, uh, which in the HI 2020, uh, HW, sorry, 2020. But before we, uh, before we get up the audience question, I have some questions for you, Hugo. Uh, you, you're talking about diversifying your portfolio, but you're also diversifying your offshore wind portfolio with bottom fixed and floating. Uh, could you say something on uh, what your preferences will be and how how fast are you willing to do to, to develop your floating uh, offshore wind uh, portfolio? Uh, it, we, we will do that fast. We believe that um, because there are certain areas where bottom fix is just not possible. So on one side, we will see the, the bottom fix part uh, uh, being today cheaper. Um, at the same time, if you look at the cost curve of bottom fix, what happened over the last few years, it, it's quite surprisingly, right? Uh, it was not so long ago that a bottom fixed uh, project in the Netherlands was like 170 euros per megawatt hour. Um, uh, Blau Wind, uh, one of the projects we, uh, we almost finalized uh, building, was at 55 euros per megawatt hour. Um, and we believe that uh, we can go through a similar cost curve on floating and therefore enabling offshore wind also in areas of, of deeper water. So our position is not to wait for that, but do that parallel and therefore getting costs down and, and making it more attractive and, and have a larger potential of offshore wind. Hmm. Uh, interesting. Uh, there is a question here from the audience. Uh, do you see a need for change in mindset when trans transferring knowledge and expertise from oil and gas activity into offshore wind? If so, uh, which areas? And one of the areas that I know people are looking into is the HSC area. Yeah, the, the HSC is an important factor, right? The, um, uh, if you look at the records now, uh, offshore wind is, is really behind. Um, it, it's around a factor five worse than the oil and gas. So for sure, we will use our knowledge and experience to make offshore wind uh, safer. Uh, but that's just one of the uh, areas where, where we think it will work. The other area is the supply chain. Um, using our knowledge on the supply chain uh, in ever uh, becoming bigger projects, we believe is also an, uh, something we can learn of each other. Um, and there are also differences. So it must, we think it must go both ways, right? And uh, use the, the good things from both worlds and, and make it work for offshore wind. Mm. Your, your colleague from Equinor, he said earlier today that Norway doesn't actually need the offshore wind because we ha don't have a home market uh, uh, that is willing to pay the price. But what, what, how do you see the market condition in Europe, the electricity pricing, and, and will you be able to make money on this? Yeah, I, I have a, a different <laughs> view, I think. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that um, looking at the long term, it would be good for Norway to have a strong position in renewables. You have already have it, of course, in, in hydro for the power production uh, uh, in, in the country. But actually, you have a very good system where you can balance the offshore wind with your hydro. Uh, at the same time, producing green hydrogen and exporting it I think could be the, the let's say the new products uh, from Norway and combining that with uh, uh, blue hydrogen as well. Mm. So I think you have a, an ideal mix 
to uh, really go for the right thing in 2050 uh, or even, of course, earlier. And, and to reach that goal, we or you need to start <laughs> now, I would say. I think we need to close by that. Thank you very much, Hugo, for joining us from Hague. It's been a great pleasure. So have a great day and we'll continue here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I promised you that we are uh, what to touch on money and capital and if access to capital is easy or difficult when discussing offshore wind projects. And we are glad to have with us two experts uh, from, uh, from the bank of DNB to help us understand what are the critical elements to succeed from a financial point of view and from an M&A point of view. So I wish to welcome uh, Andreas Oström, he's the Senior Vice President of Offshore Wind uh, in DNB, and Martin Husebe Carlsen from Equity Research in DNB Market. Welcome. I'll just go down here. <laughs> Thank you so much. We are very pleased to be here in Stavanger and attend this uh, conference, uh, although it is uh, a combination of being both here physically as well, uh, virtually. Uh, offshore wind, how is, how is DNB looking at that uh, within the ocean industries? And that is particularly focused on the service industry. So uh, I will uh, give some perspectives from how the bank I is viewing this and raising capital. And together with me, I also have Martin husby Carson, our eminent equity analyst uh, in uh, oil service, offshore, and also renewables. How do DNB approach offshore wind? We think this is the convergence of knowledge between renewables as well as within the maritime offshore ocean industries. Uh, and together with capital, how are we going to transform ourselves for a low carbon future? In DNB, we have a long and uh, strong track record within renewable financing. Uh, that is uh, hydropower, it is solar, it is wind, both in Norway and globally. We also have a good experience and knowledge about infrastructure uh, risk and, and project financing uh, structures. That in combination with the ocean industries, that is oil and gas, shipping, uh, oil service and offshore and seafood, is a combination we are trying to combine together with our capabilities to raise capital, both in the public equity markets as well as in the bank market. Uh, we have committed already 450 uh, billion Norwegian kroner for green financing uh, within renewables and infrastructure. And that means that we will also allocate more capital uh, towards the offshore wind supply chain. So what do we mean by the offshore wind supply chain uh, from an ocean industry perspective? That is very much what is uh, the ocean-related aspects of this uh, illustrated wind farm. And I don't know if we should have... Here we have my last slide, and here we have this slide. So what do we mean by the ocean industries? And it is very much what we see here, substation, foundations, and turbines, and the companies that have assets to install these turbines uh, and to uh, install and transport the foundations, as well as the, the cables that needs to be done on the subsea. And why are we so excited about offshore wind? I think you've seen the first graph here in many different forms already. Uh, we believe there's a lot of gigawatts that is going to be installed globally. Uh, we have in this graph looked at the global market with the exceptions of China, that we think is a more uh, domestic market and not so relevant for the supply industry. And in addition, you see a tectonic shift in allocation of capital towards green assets and companies with a high ESG score. That is uh, an environmental, social and governance focus. And this is just illustrated with the offshore wind uh, indices compared to offshore drilling and exploration and production. But, it's always a but for financing, uh, how are the supply industry going to make money in a world that will look a little bit like this? The cost curves 
are going to fall. And this is the main assumption in order to make offshore wind commercially uh, viable, both on bottom fixed as well as floating offshore wind. And what should be the allocation of risk between the developers and the suppliers in order to bring these costs down? And what will be the implications of the capital need that is there in this industry in order to uh, uh, reduce these costs? And there is a capital need. Uh, as we have seen earlier today, and uh, as we also uh, describe here, uh, the cost reductions is very much explained by scale economics. The windmills um, are getting bigger and the wind farms are getting larger. And you also see that these technologies have been very rapidly implemented within the market. Uh, and the key implication here for the ocean service industry that's going to look into this market in order to build this uh, platform and th this um, offshore wind farms is what kind of investments are needed to make the fleet of vessels fit for purpose to install these larger turbines, the larger monopiles, uh, and also uh, build out what is needed from the uh, seabed infrastructure. And to answer that question, I have with me uh, Martin Huspikartsen, who is uh, looking a little bit more on the uh, equity uh, side of things. Um, so if you would like to join the stage. Sure. <clears throat> okay, th <clears throat> thank you, Andreas. So, ba based on what Andreas just talked about, namely the massive growth that we're supposed to see, but also the larger turbines, there is a set of opportunities for the service value chain going forward, but there are also some challenges uh, ahead. Uh, the growth itself is obviously a clear positive that would support for pa capacity expansion across the value chain. Uh, the larger turbines on the other side uh, put some new restrictions onto vessels doing installation of wind farms today. And first of all, for turbine installation, we believe new vessels are needed with a higher capacity crane, be simply being able to lift the, the new generation turbines in, in place, but also for foundations, new vessels are needed in order to deal with greater water depths and also larger foundations to, to assist the larger turbines. <coughs> uh, new, new wind farms also are typically further away from shore, implying that larger and more efficient vessels will be preferred by the developers. And finally, there is a strong focus in the entire offshore wind value chain, also including the installation phase, uh, to reduce emissions. Uh, this could be executed by having dual fuel installation vessels, making them hydrogen ready, for instance. And this is something that is already being included as options on new builds ordered today. To modify the existing fleet out there of installation vessels would be largely impossible, best case, uh, highly expensive, we, we think, to, to deal with the emission criteria in, in this industry. So in other words, uh, we are not only optimistic about the growth in demand for these vessels, but we also believe that a large part of the current installation fleet will become obsolete due to the ongoing industry trends. So taking a step back, looking at the service va value chain for installation of bottom fixed offshore wind. So, uh, Separate vessels are needed for each type of the key components of a wind farm. So in other words, one vessel is needed for foundation installation, one vessel is needed for substation, then you need separate vessels for export cables and inter array cables. And finally, a separate vessel is needed for turbine in installation. And as you can see, the landscape today is quite fragmented. You have a large number of companies doing all these services, but the majority of the companies are doing on, only a small portion of, uh, of the service offering. I would say, generally speaking, there are two groups of companies. You have companies that have been active in offshore wind for quite some time, like Dime, Fanord, Jan de Nul, and then you have companies that have migrated from oil and gas, like Saipem and 
sub-C7. And in addition, there is also a couple of new entrants to this market, which we will touch on shortly. So until recently, the <coughs> offshore wind market have predominantly been a European market, and this is also highly reflected in the domicile of the companies active in the installation value chain. As you can see here, it's mostly Dutch and Belgian companies that are leading the way, and we believe this is simply driven by the fact that the southern part of the North Sea has been the uh, driving area for offshore wind in Europe until now, and in other words, um, the supply chain for services have a local footprint in those countries, just like oil and gas service value chain have a footprint here in Norway. So I would say that give, given the strong presence Norway have in maritime, oil services and, and shipping industries, some might be a little bit disappointed that it's only a few Norwegian companies on, uh, active in the space at the moment. Uh, there are some, some exceptions uh, of companies that have been successful. Uh, I would in particular highlight Fred Olsen Wind Carrier, which have been highly successful in turbine installation, having installed roughly 20% of all turbines that are in Europe today. Uh, in addition, uh, Norway-based uh, OHT is a new entrant to the market, and that company has recently taken significant steps to develop its service offering. And this is also something that we in, in DMB markets have been fortunate to, to be a part of, so I thought I'd share some of that story with, with you here today. So the way OHT uh, is, is today is actually the result of a combination with a smaller company, off, uh, Wind Offshore Installation. And that was a startup company originated out of Stavanger by Rune Magnus Lundetre and two other local gentlemen. Wind uh, in Offshore Installation was launched early 2020, so it was a fairly young company. And the idea with the company was to develop vessels and order vessels for installation of next generation turbines. After it was launched, we all know that COVID hit and it was massive turbulence in the capital markets. Uh, the company evaluated different uh, strategic alternatives, all from raising capital and starting up from scratch as a standalone company to do uh, combinations with other players already in the industry. Uh, the outcome of this process was that OHT, was a, uh, OH, OHT acquired wind. And uh, some of you might not be familiar with, with OHT. That is a company out of Oslo backed by shipping and uh, offshore <coughs> entrepreneur Arne Blista. And the primary business of OHT has been markets of, uh, when OHT raised its uh, in initial capital, but I think it's one key lesson learned from both our side, and I also think that is echoed by the, by the investors. It is uh, that the capital markets put a lot of value to companies having a track record and having an organization in place, so it's more to this company than just the assets, and that is uh, highly important for the investment community. So with that, I leave it over to Andreas for a couple of concluding remarks. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, I think it's a very good example with uh, OHT and uh, the story Martin uh, described. And I think if you should look at the industry characteristics of the supply uh, industry to offshore wind, uh, it can be recognized with asymmetric power in the value chain, but that we mean it's a highly fragmented uh, service industry and a few larger developers. You have highly specialized assets that are fit for purpose and tailor-made for the exact job they should do. Uh, you have limited cash flow visibility. With that, we mean that some of these wind farms, they are built out in stages. They're not necessarily giving you a five to 10 year contract for the development side of things. Um, you have accelerated technology risk. You have an ambition to become carbon neutral also in the value chain, which means like what kind of vessel will you uh, invest in today? And there is a lot of spare yard capacity globally, which means that you will probably not see a uh, inflation in, in prices. So financiers, what do we think around? 
many banks have been through a very difficult crisis within the offshore industry. And uh, you saw some of these characteristics. They might also be similar for that business. So there's a lot of learnings being made in the industry. And banks are being regulated differently than we have been in earlier cycles as well. So there is a strong preference for cash flow visibility. You need standardized assets, uh, allocation towards greener assets and loans, proven management skills, and in general, a more conservative risk appetite. So what would be then the recommendations for companies that are seeing this as a very interesting business to move into or will be part of their transition from fossil-related industries towards more renewable industries? We think it's very important that you have integrated operations uh, and that you're not a pure asset play. Uh, if you have a good idea and want to go to a yard in, uh, in Asia and develop the next best thing, it might be very difficult to find capital to, to do that investment. Cash flow visibility, how can you obtain that? How can you get a backlog uh, with the, your partners? Um, you need to have assets that are fit for purpose. What do we mean by that? It's very difficult to know what will be the right asset for the future and what will be the right cost point. Uh, for that asset to be uh, profitable. Um, management and track record we talked about, and I think the last point is very important to uh, summarize. I think as, develop, as suppliers to this industry, you need to come into a position where you become a partner to the other developers. And that in combination, you are working in developing that pipeline that you would like to do. And I hear it's Everybody needs to come together in a way uh, so that not too much of the risk uh, from, um, uh, is offloaded from the developers to the suppliers in order to bring that cost curve down. Because we think it will be difficult to raise capital for the suppliers if that risk is not evenly balanced. And that goes back again to the government to what kind of overall schemes that will be put in place in order to make the capital uh, attractive and, and the offshore wind uh, a success for the future. So with that, uh, I would like to conclude and thank you. Thank you. If there was a question on the slide, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you some questions. Uh, so if they're up there, you can just put them on the, on the screen. Otherwise, I'll just stop by ans uh, asking one question to you, Andreas, because when we talked uh, on the phone earlier uh, last week, I think you said, in order to make money, cost is key. Mm -hmm. And we need to find ways of collaborating among the players to get costs down. Mm. But how do you think we're going to balance competing and collaborating along the value chain at the same time? It's a very good question, and I think uh, Equinor mentioned it earlier as well, that the uh, service and supply industry uh, from the Norwegian players has, have been very competitive, uh, also on the global scale. Mm. Um, but I think we also need to build a um, pipeline of projects so that uh, it's rational to invest in technology mm. uh, for the longer term. And there I think we need to uh, con cooperate in a way and not mm. necessarily have uh, an auction every time you're doing something, mm. but you, you work in the partnership that this is maybe the long-term ambitions we would like to work towards and you bring your suppliers with you. Because I don't think the uh, developers will be able to make it alone and I don't think there is an ambition to make mm. it alone either. Mm. It sounds like the uh, alliances models of the oil and gas industry, actually. <laughs> I think it's, we have to go back to I have the one start. question to, to Martin as well, uh, I have to ask, because you, you mentioned that there is a potential of, of kind of the installation fleet for Norway. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, we, are, we are here at the coast, and there's a lot of uh, petro-maritime industry which has been hit hard over the last years, and they are looking for opportunities. Um, where do you see the... Solsta and Eidesvik and uh, Möckstar into this picture. Mm. Where are the opportunities or are they there? Well, I think what, what we addressed now was mostly installation of mm. bottom fixed mm. uh, wind farms. So uh, another part of the quality life cycle of a wind farm would obviously be operation and maintenance. Mm. And uh, that could require or, or definitely do require 
service vessels, mm -hmm. and we, we believe the, the main business opportunity for the OSV industry would be related to servicing wind farms that have already been commissioned and, and installed. <coughs> mm -hmm. And also when it comes to floating wind, uh, the installation process will probably take place uh, close to shore, mm -hmm. and someone have to tow these uh, turbines out to the sea, and that, that could also be executed by those companies, but uh, for the installation of bottom fixed, we see very limited uh, business opportunities for those companies, unfortunately. Mm. Thank you to Andreas and Martin. It's a great pleasure. Give them an applause. <laughs> now we're moving over to the new kids on the block, because that's uh, Arco Offshore Wind. They took the opportunity of the COVID situation to restructure the companies, and I have to say that the timing seems very, very good looking back. Uh, and they've been uh, awarded on their uh, uh, shareholder values. Uh, Johan Sandberg, he is the senior business manager from Arc of Showin. He explains why they've done what they've done and what are their targets going forward. Listen to this, and he'll join us live afterwards. Remember to use slido.com to ask your questions. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Johan Sandberg. I'm working with Arker Offshore Wind, and uh, thank you very much for inviting us here today to tell you a little bit about ourselves and uh, the offshore wind industry. First of all, who is Arker Offshore Wind? Well, we are a pure play, deep water, wind independent power producer. It means that we are targeting the offshore wind market in the deep water segment. And we define deep water in the range around 60 meters or deeper. So basically, uh, most of that is going to be deep enough to build floating wind turbines, uh, but it could potentially also be just on the borderline to bottom fixed where we might use jacket foundations to, to actually build bottom fixed wind as well. But, uh, but our clear target is the floating wind market. So uh, we have uh, a strong background from, from uh, Acker and the Acker Group. We uh, have been working with Acker Solutions within Acker Solutions for a few years before we were spun out of Acker Solutions and listed on the Oslo Stock Exchange in August this year. And uh, we have already now a, a pipeline of projects that I will come back to at the end of my presentation. So, uh, before we were a part of Arca Solutions, and now we belong to, uh, or we are owned, majority owned by a company called Arca Horizons, which is the green sort of development or, or new market development arm of the Arca family, uh, focusing on uh, uh, new value chains like CCS and, and renewable energy. But we obviously also have a very strong tie to the rest of the Arca companies, such as Arca Solutions, Arca BP, and Cognite, and so on. So we think that it's by having this strong muscle from the Arca group and, uh, and backing from them, uh, built up with, uh, combined with uh, uh, being listed now as an own company can give us this uh, strength and agility to move forward fast in this industry. So Arca, the Arca group has a strong history and, and a long history. We've been around for more than 175 years, starting starting in Norway in the 1800s, working with hydropower and uh, hydropower turbines, then moving into the maritime industry and, and shipbuilding. And as you, can see, as you can see on the picture to the left, uh, this is Akebrygge in Oslo, uh, quite a few years ago, where it looked quite different from what it looks like today. And then obviously when Norway found oil in the late 60s, it was natural to move into the oil and gas industry and to develop that industry as well. So Arca Solutions has designed and developed the majority of the floating uh, offshore oil and gas structures in the world, the floating substructures. So the same substructures that, that you see in the upper right corner here is, is a core competence of Arca Solutions. And that competence we have also now leveraged upon when we have moved into the floating and offshore wind industry. So on the, on the last picture to the right, in, in the lower right corner, you will see this uh, smaller wind turbine semi-submersible structures that we, we are now working with in, in uh, Arca Offshore Wind. 
So uh, we build upon a, lo- a strong heritage of engineering and, uh, and industry development. And we are now moving into the renewables industry here. So as we can see, for the forecast for renewables until 2050, a significant portion of the global electricity mix will be wind. About 25%, as you can see on, on this slide. And it's, it's uh, growing very, very fast. And it has a very important part of the, of the CO2 reductions that we all aim to achieve through the Paris Agreement. We also see that uh, while onshore wind power is, is now a very mature market and a very, uh, with very low margins and very cost competitive levelized cost of energy, offshore wind and particularly floating wind is still in its infancy with only pilot projects or prototypes being built. And we now think that this can take off and, and go into a commercial scale industry where we will see this very fast cost reduction uh, for, uh, for electricity. And offshore wind power, uh, as you can see on this slide, the vast majority of the potential for offshore wind power is in the deep water segment. Uh, something like 96 or 97 percent of all seas in the world is deeper than 60 meters, but far from all of that is, is possible to explore or to develop for, for offshore wind. So what you see here with the 70 to 80 percent of the waters being deeper than 60 percent, that is the develop uh, that the area that is uh, possible for development around the world. So that's uh, fairly close to the coast, uh, fairly close to load centers where cities are and where people live and where you consume electricity. And that's where we think that this massive growth potential will be. You also have much stronger winds when you go further out. And we see, for instance, that with onshore wind power, we are now up at around 30 to 40 percent capacity factor. For bottom fixed offshore wind, that is even higher, 45 to 50% capacity factor. And when we go to floating wind, we can really choose the best locations independently of the water depth. We can reach up to 60% capacity factor. And this is not only good for the levelized cost of energy because it's obviously producing a much larger part of the time. It's also good for the power system, which does not have to deal with as, as much fluctuations in the, in the power production as we have with, um, with, for instance, onshore wind. And obviously, when you go further out into deep waters and when you're able to choose your locations uh, better, then you also have less conflict with other interests, such as the fishing industry or military or visual impact from shore or shipping or other interests, basically. So that's why we think this, has a, this industry has such a great, uh, great potential. So as I mentioned before, we have a strong history in the ARCA group. We think now that we can leverage upon that when we go into the offshore wind industry. So for instance, the work that we have done in, in subsea oil and gas, we think we can take that with us to develop subsea substations, for instance. I mentioned before the semi-submersible structures, the floating structures. That's definitely something we bring with us when we develop these floating wind turbine structures. The whole digital arm where, where for instance, Cognite work with big data and digital twins and so on, that's clearly something we will leverage upon in the offshore wind industry here. And when we combine it all together, we can really, we can really see how new opportunities comes up and, and especially in the interface between value chains. So for instance, the interface between offshore wind power and hydrogen, or between offshore wind power and the fishing industry or other industries as well. We think it's really interesting opportunities uh, right where these value chains meet. So for, um, for the cost reduction, uh, we, uh, we think that we can play an important role in reducing the cost of energy from, from uh, floating wind. We have this experience and background, as I say, and, and we think that there's great potential as we now move into larger projects and much larger volumes. Uh, Arca Solutions and Kvarner are merging into one company. So we have the yards uh, and the engineering coming together there. We think that can also benefit us when we are looking at fabrication of these structures in large scale, basically mass fabrication, robotization of these uh, processes when we, when we build and integrate the the components to these uh, turbines. 
And uh, as you can see, we have set ourselves a very ambitious target to, to reach something around 50 euro per megawatt hour by 2030. So this is an exciting, uh, an exciting target where we are working hard to, to achieve this. And finally, just uh, a few words about our projects. We have uh, already today two ongoing projects, one in California and one in Korea. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we actually launched the floating LIDAR into the water in Korea. So that was an exciting and important milestone for us. We are also working with uh, several new markets and, and exciting opportunities around the world. And Norway is an obvious one uh, for us. Uh, and as is Scotland, where the Scotland process is, uh, is ongoing and will hopefully uh, end in the beginning of next year, where uh, a number of exciting projects will be launched in very large scale. So we are, we are active around the world. We have this global project uh, portfolio and, and we hope that we can grow this one uh, going forward as well. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope you think this sounds interesting and exciting and I'm uh, very much looking forward to hear questions. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. So uh, you are with us uh, live from uh, Oslo, I think. That's right. Yeah, that's right. From home today. Yeah. From home. Uh, someone said in the break that sounds like kind of like a Grand Prix when I'm introducing people from all around the world. But Oslo is good. <laughs> okay. Um, my first question is: uh, In your presentation, you you describe ARCA as being part of the energy development and, and played a significant role in building big structures throughout history. But you're now going into offshore wind, and offshore wind is something different. It's mass fabrication, it's lower margin. Uh, how are you going to deliver on, on also on, on this, this kind of project? It's a very good question and, uh, and very relevant. I, I think you're really hitting the, the nail with that question because it's, uh, it's one of the mo most fundamental differences between offshore wind and oil and gas is the fact that this is, this is a business of mass production and low margin uh, and really squeezing every little millimeter out of the <laughs> out of the structure if you can so we we really try to look into the fabrication processes in great detail to uh, to achieve these cost reductions as i mentioned but it's also about project development in large scale uh, and i think we can leverage some of the experience from the oil and gas industry for these large offshore projects so uh, I guess it's a combination of that, trying to take the best from oil and gas and really try to, take, to avoid bringing with us uh, unnecessary costs. Mm. Paul Ettrem said uh, earlier today that actually it was an advantage for them that the offshore wind project has gotten bigger and bigger because those are more related to the projects that are done hist historically. Uh, this week you presented your quarterly results and uh, in that presentation, uh, uh, Norway and Scotland were mentioned as, as uh, one of the most uh, obvious markets to go for. What are your reflections on the differences in, in between these two and similarities? Well, I think first of all, we're obviously operating around the same basin. So, so uh, the North Sea Basin of, of water is, is a sort of common market for us and a share market already now in oil and gas. And this has been built up over decades and there is uh, fantastic strong relations between Scotland and Norway in the oil and gas industry. And uh, we would really welcome a close uh, collaboration between the two countries uh, in this industry as well. Uh, and as you mentioned, Scotland is really moving forward very fast on, on offshore wind and they have a, a, a fairly large portion of their ambitions dedicated at floating as well. So I think Norway really needs to make sure that uh, that we also keep these high ambitions for ourselves because otherwise this market is gonna be uh, taken over by, by others basically because mm. there are so many others, other markets being developed uh, in parallel with Norway. Mm. And so to the elephant in the room, what's your plans in Norway? <laughs> well, I think we've been fairly, uh, fairly transparent. Uh, in fact, when we were launched on the stock exchange, we had, uh, we, we explained uh, what we were aiming for in Norway. We, uh, we are very excited about these two projects being launched and we have high ambitions to, to develop offshore wind here in Norway. Mm. 
I introduced you as being the uh, new kid on the block, but uh, I hope that uh, actually our uh, offshore wind will be the kid on the uh, offshore wind block. So I wish you the best uh, in, 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 in chasing that opportunity. Thank you, Johan. Thank you very much. Now to the last uh, presentation in this session, because all opportunities come with a set of risks. And I would say that if you look back, the greatest profits has come with greater risks. Uh, we will hear from an experts on what is possible and what is not possible when it comes to offshore wind. Uh, Magnus Christian Ebbesen, he is the business lead on floating wind advisory in DNVGL. He sent us this video yesterday afternoon. Thanks a lot for that uh, introduction. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, Magnus Ebbesen and the business lead for Floating Wind Adv Advisory. I will talk about floating wind risk and opportunities as seen from us as an advisor to the floating wind industry. First, a bit about DNEGL. We have worked on 97% of all offshore wind farms. We have certified 80% of all offshore wind farms in floating wind, we are a leading certification body and technical advisor for investors. We have been involved in more than nine floating wind transactions where we have supported financiers in assessing the technical and commercial aspects of floating wind projects and floating wind technology. We have also 150 years experience working with offshore technologies and have offices in 100 countries. And we as a company believe the future is floating. From one month ago, we launched the fourth edition of our energy transition outlook. This is our best estimate of the world's energy system towards 2050. We are in the midst of a drastic change. The world will, in the course of the next three decades, go through a dramatic change both in demand and production of energy. As more of our society is Electrified demand for electricity grows, and our analysis shows that one-fifth of offshore wind in 2050 will be floating, which is about 2% of the world's global electricity demand. And to show how much this 2% actually is, I'd like to show the following graph. In Norway now, they are, have just started the construction of the world's largest floating wind farm. As you all know, the 88 megawatt high wind tampen. Our calculations show that over the next 30 years, we will build the equivalent of 3000 high wind tampons, which jumps up to more than 250 gigawatt of installed capacity. But we see there are two major challenges that need to be overcome for us to fully take up the potential for floating offshore wind. We need to show that we can get the cost of energy down. This means getting the capex and opex and cost of capital down, but also getting the energy production up. But we also need to give the confidence to the stakeholders. That is the supply chain that needs to give confidence to the developers the developers that need to give confidence to the financiers, and also developers that need to give confidence to the regulators and the government. I showed our projected, projected development of floating wind. But for this to be a reality, cost really needs to go down. According to our analysis, floating wind will go down almost 70% to a global average of 40 euro per megawatt hour in 2050. We really believe this will happen, but that is also based on our belief that we will get larger turbine, larger wind farms, and our trust that the industry, and hopefully the Norwegian industry as well, will come with significant technology development and establish a highly cost competitive supply chain. And how does this cost reduction look at a particular site? Here we have modeled the same size uh, site in 2025 and 2040. And we believe that we can get about 50% reduction in CAPEX from 2025 and 2040 in this period. And 80% and reduction will be on the floating structure, mooring and anchoring and internal cabling, which are very floating wind specific. 
This is mainly driven by, by larger turbine. We assume 12 megawatt turbines in 2025, but 18 megawatt turbines in 2040. But also due to technology innovation and, and the highly competitive supply chain, as mentioned earlier. So we need the cost to go down, but we also need to get confidence in the floating wind technology as well. The challenge is that floating wind is opening up new markets which might not be familiar with offshore wind and other offshore industries. And we need new technology, as mentioned, to get the cost reduction. We also have to cope with new conditions, which also impacts technology choice. That's, for example, deeper waters and different soil and different metal ocean conditions. And we also see that floating wind is going really globally much quicker than bottom fixed, which also impacts the players that we will see. So it'll be new players both due to ge geographical constraints, but also due to local content requirements. And all of these areas, aspects shown on this slide will impact the cost and risk, which of course could be a challenge that needs to be handled. On top of this, floating wind has some other unique challenges compared to, to bottom fixed. The turbine initially designed for bottom fixed will need a, a specialized controller. The movement of the turbine is expected to change the power curve, which reduces the production. In addition, there are uncertainties related to the long-term effect of the movement on the reliability, reliability of the turbine. Electrical, the movement of the floater requires dynamic cables. There's additional challenge itself due to the fatigue, but on top of this, dynamic cables for voltage level over 66 kV has not yet been qualified. Good solutions for disconnecting connecting cables is needed for, for, the, for maintenance. Floating substations is also another thing that need to be qualified. When it comes to the substructure, it's something new in a way that is more complex than jacket, monopiles and towers. And there are more units that have had to made, be made less costly uh, than in shipbuilding or in oil and gas uh, industry. And we still have more than 40 different concepts and no unified way of fabricating these things. Mooring failure is another unique floating offshore wind aspect that we need to consider. For installation, we need sufficient onshore crane cap capabilities. There are not that many onshore cranes available to install the future large turbines on the floaters. The installation operation in itself can be a bit challenging when you have to build something on top of a floating movement structures. When it comes to the maintenance activities related to foundation, we consider that more complex. And also major component exchange is also another area where you have to pull the turbine into shore and replace a component. We have not seen that being done yet in the student industry from what I'm aware of. In addition, floating wind has more components that are more coupled, which leads to potential higher contractual interfacing risk. We really see this as a major concern in the projects we have been involved in. Floating wind can really leverage the experience from bottom fixed wind and oil and gas, but, but there are some differences that need to be assessed. I'm not gonna go into details on this, but, but you see that for design and fabrications, only tower and export cables that are considered to a high relevant experience. For installation, it's only mooring and anchoring and export cable that have high relevant experience. And for operation, it's only normal VTG maintenance, which have high relevant experience. All of the areas, the relevant experience is medium or low. For example, the sign and fabrication of mooring and anchoring can draw on experience from oil and gas. However, the significant differences in the number of mooring lines or mooring arrangement, the loads and the cost requirements. Therefore, we consider level of experience as medium and not high for the supply of the the mooring arrangement. So looking at this picture, picture and what I've shown, it's clear that we're dealing with some new risks and new challenges in, in floating wind. The good news is that these risks can be managed. We have already now two projects installed, Highland Scotland Wind for Atlantic, which have proved that floating wind farm can be installed in different markets with different technologies, that they can perform very well, evident by the capacity factor that Highland Scotland has shown.
But I also see these challenges as a huge opportunity and especially a huge opportunity for Norwegian industry. There is room for new innovations and players that can solve the technical challenges and help getting the required cost reduction. And I believe the Norwegian industry with our extensive competence from offshore and maritime industry and our soon to come home market with both Highland, Tampen and Utsira, we should be very well positioned to take a big global role. Thank you a lot for allowing me to speak. We believe the future is floating. <laughs> I look forward to hearing your questions. So Magnus will be with us. Uh, your questions, remember, slido.com. Magnus, are you here hearing the questions? There you are. Hi, Magnus. Hello, hi. hi. Thank you for your good uh, reflections on technology and what is possible and what is not possible. Um, we've had a long day here and we've learned a lot about offshore wind. And, but when I spoke to you last week, you explained to me the importance of technology trust, that we were trust in technology. Could you elaborate on what you mean by that? Yes, so we are, So I think it's, of course, uh, one thing is important is we have to have good ideas to get the, to get the required cost reduction, of course, and, uh, and that is vital. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, we also need to have confidence. Uh, people who invest in floating wind or if it's either coming to the equity investment or, or debt financing, uh, they need to trust that the projects will work as expected. Um, so I think, but, that, but that's one area where at least there are a lot of a lot of ex experience uh, with, with with standards and procedures and technology qualification, etc. So there's it, it's something that's need possible to handle, but but of course extremely extremely important, and we see that from the the investors and the financier community that we talk to. Mm. You, you, you explained to us that there, you mentioned that there is 140 different concepts being evaluated. How are we going to go from 140 down to a few? <laughs> yeah, I, I talked to you. Yeah, I guess it was not 140. I guess it was more, more than uh, more than 40. More but, than 40. Uh, that, sorry. <laughs> no, no. But it's a, it's a very good, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, uh, and I think if I could went back maybe five or ten years, I would maybe say that it would be just a few now, but we still see that we are coming in more and more concepts all the time. So I think that kind of shows that the well, there's not this perfect solution yet. Uh, so uh, there are still challenges, and there are, are kind of strengths and weaknesses with all concepts. So so I think we still will see a lot of, of different concepts, and uh, and perhaps perhaps it might not be just these three, but perhaps it will be be more. But I think at some point, perhaps it will go go down from forty to to a smaller number. Mm. There's a question here from the audience. Do you see uh, a risk that will there be shortfall of skills from transfer, transferring from oil and gas into floating offshore wind? Will you need to recruit people from other countries or are we able to fulfill the positions ourselves? I don't know if I'm the best to answer that question, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I think I am at least very confident into the the oil and gas industry and the maritime industry in, in Norway. And I see all the companies that are, are involved and also are very, uh, very um, active in trying to get a position. So I think there's uh, just quite a lot of knowledge and quite a lot of experience in, in Norway that can be used for offshore wind, that's at least my view. Hmm. And my last question is, um, do you see a significant difference in the value chain in offshore wind compared to the oil and gas industry in Norway? <laughs> uh, mm, no, I think, and I think the, you, it was mentioned in the report earlier uh, in this presentation was said that 40%, wasn't it, of, of the supply chain is similar as oil and gas. And I mm. can really believe that it's a lot of things similar. Um, so I think we have, and we have kind of experts on all various bits and pieces uh, from the oil and gas industry. Uh, but I think it's the, the challenge is, of course, putting it into uh, the system and kind of the complex floating wind system. And I think there's a little bit of the reason why I kind of show 
a show kind of the relevant experience. I think there's so much good experience from the oil and gas industry uh, towards uh, offshore wind, but the kind of what's missing is that you need you need to see that into the uh, the floating wind industry, which is uh, so, some different loads, uh, but also it needs to be serial produced and also kind of diff- very different uh, cost requirements. Mm. Thank you, Magnus. I think we'll close with the uh, the last uh, sentence in your presentation that challenges is, needs to be seen as opportunities, and we'll bring that to lunch. So thank you, Magnus, uh, for for talking to us. Thank you a lot for allowing us to speak. I said lunch, but we're done with that. So, so, so. Uh, but now we're going to have a break. It's time for a break. It's time to refill your coffee. Um, I remind you to keep uh, the distance. It's still your responsibility to keep the one meter. Uh, enjoy coffee and be back by two o'clock to listen to the industry and the supply industry itself and the politicians. Stay tuned. Come on. Bye bye. <laughs>